Today I'm going to talk about how lungs actually work, how much air you get into them, and generally how uh, we decide whether we should be breathing heavily or not. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, hold on a moment. All right. I get better without the uh, thing. So first of all, let's talk about breathing because you do it constantly, right? All the time. You're sitting here pretty much breathing. If you are not sitting here breathing, you probably should because you need oxygen. So, but if you're sitting here breathing like me, you probably don't need a lot of oxygen right this moment. Oxygen is a pretty good commodity, but our body uses it very rapidly and then waits it gets more. It's a little bit hard to store, so we only really use what we need. So we're not breathing very heavily right this moment. We're just breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. And since it moves in and out and in and out, very consistently, kind of like a tide. We call that amount of air a tidal volume. And it's not very much. You're breathing in and out maybe, maybe a cup of air at one given amount of time. So, and a cup is not very much. A cup is not like a cup of coffee from Duncan. In fact, that's a cup and a half. It's a pretty small amount. So, maybe the amount of a fist. So, you gotta think of an actual one cup measure. Now, your lungs hold a lot more air than that. And in fact, you can push a fair amount of air out if you try. So if I take in the deepest possible breath I can, and then push it out. Push out until I can't push out any more air. That is the complete amount of air that I can take in and push out. That is called the vital capacity. So that is a lot more air. In most people, that air is liters worth of air. In most women, it's usually at least 3,500 liters worth, maybe even 4,000. In most men, 4,500 to 5,000 liters. So what's a liter in terms of volume? Well, a soda, like you buy at the store, is in a two liter. So if you have 4,000 liters worth of air in your lungs, you have two soda bottles worth of air in your lungs, one in each, which makes sense. That seems to be about the right amount of air to be able to push out. Is that it? If I push all the air out, is it all gone? Ah, well, it's not actually, because you have a reserve volume of air that you can't push out. So your lungs keep a little bit of air at the bottom. And it's not at the bottom. I mean, it's in the lungs. It's just not able to be physically pushed out. And that is called the reserve. And that's a pretty small amount as well. So your lungs can hold a lot of air if you need them, which is why you increase your breathing when you need something because you can get more oxygen than just sitting here breathing your normal tidal volume. So that's the basics. So the next is how do the lungs actually do this whole expanding, contracting process? We mentioned the structures of the lungs yesterday. We talked about how it has the trachea and the bronchi and different things like that. And that's made out of cartilage. The epithelial tissue lines of the lungs and the alveoli, that's epithelia. The pleural membrane is also epithelia. But wait, to move things in the body, you need some kind of muscle, because nothing moves without a muscle. But there's really no muscle actually physically attached to your lungs. Muscle contraction is a hard process. It's physical, it moves things. Your lungs are very delicate materials. Gases have to be able to diffuse through them. They can't be thick, they can't be too hard. So your bronchi or cartilage, they're fairly tough, but the actual parts of the lungs that move and that need to expand to pick up air are more delicate. So how does that actually work? Well, you have two muscles that are involved in the movement of the lungs. One of them you're probably familiar with, it is the diaphragm. It is just beneath the lungs. And then the other one is the intercostal muscles. Actually, these are a bunch of muscles because they're all the ones between the ribs. All right, I have to stand up to show you how to breathe. See if I can do this right. So here's how breathing actually works. I'm gonna breathe in. The big thing that happens is when I breathe in, 
my diaphragm pushes down. It's kind of a round muscle and it pushes down, which actually pushes my belly out. So when I breathe in, my belly goes out because my diaphragm pushes down. My intercostal muscles, they come upward. They don't go like up, up, they just come out towards me. So I create a whole bunch of space. Negative space produces pressure. And what the lungs wanna do is they want to fill that negative space. There's a whole bunch of this internal pressure inside your lungs. You've created a big space around them. What are you gonna do? Well, if you open your mouth, air is gonna rush in to fill those lungs up. It's not even a process you technically really control. If your mouth is open and there's space, air is gonna come in. Swimmers use this technique a lot, and I know because I swam for a number of years, because the idea is, is that you push all the air out into the water. So if you're stroking, your head's in the water, you push all the air out into the water. Now you really want air. When you turn your head sideways, all you have to do is open up everything, open your mouth, and air rushes on in, and you don't have to spend any energy really on that process because everything wants to happen, and it's very fast. That's inspiration to let the air in. Diaphragm down, intercostals out. Then to expire the air to let it go out again. Both of those muscles actually relax. And when they relax, the intercostals fall because gravity down onto the lungs, which puts more pressure onto the lungs. The diaphragm's natural resting position is up. So if I relax that, it actually pops back up, pushing the lungs up again and letting the air fall back out. And that is the process of expiration. So you don't move your shoulders and you don't actually move your lungs, but you do move your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles to let the air in. It's a really cool process. You can actually test it out. There are some videos uh, that show this with like balloons in a space. You pull the space around them and the balloons expand. It's real cool. If I remember, I'll put the link underneath the video. All right, so now we need to talk about negative feedback. And we've talked about negative feedback before. It's one of my favorite things. And negative feedback always involves a negative feedback loop. So let me draw our negative feedback loop so we know where we're going to begin. Bump, bump. Bump, bump. And here, okay, so let's fill in the negative feedback loop. What goes at the top of the negative feedback loop? Well, that's our variable that we're trying to control. What's the variable that we need a particular amount of? In this case, that variable is the thing that gives us the energy, oxygen. We want a defined amount of oxygen. We want an amount that is in use, useful for making energy. We need enough oxygen to make energy, but you actually don't want too much oxygen because oxygen, Interestingly enough, is a toxic gas that can cause problems if there's too much of it and you don't need it. Do you know how much oxygen is actually in the air around you? It's not that much. It's only about 21% of the air around you. So even when you take in full lungs of air, you're still not getting that much oxygen. So too much oxygen in a healthy person not trying to do anything fancy can actually make you feel really weird. So, all right, what's next? Next, we need a sensor. So the sensor is our next point. And the sensor needs to detect essentially the amount of oxygen, except that it's actually kind of hard to detect the amount of oxygen. Our bodies are not very good at being oxygen sensors. As noted, there's not that much oxygen in the air. When it gets into the bloodstream, it's kind of diffused around. There's not an easy way to sense it. And in fact, if your body tells you your oxygen level is too low, it's way too low, like far below where it should be. Your body can't figure out you don't have oxygen until you're about below like 70% saturation and you should be in the 90s. So it needs a better way. And it has a better way because there's this interesting process in the bloodstream where the oxygen balances with the carbon dioxide. So you have oxygen and carbon dioxide. When the oxygen gets used up, the carbon dioxide is produced. So less oxygen in the body is always going to mean more carbon dioxide in the body. That's the way they balance. 
here's the thing with carbon dioxide. Now, this is really interesting because when you take carbon dioxide, and so I'm going to actually draw this one, CO2, and you put it in water, which is what your body is mostly made out of, and especially your bloodstream, the pieces actually interact with each other. And the oxygen likes to stick to the CO2. It produces an ion, CO3, which is negative. And the CO3 negative ion floats around in your bloodstream, and that's why we call it carbonate. And the H's separate and form H pluses hydrogen ions, which are indicative of, do you remember? Acid. Now, this doesn't happen a lot. A little bit of carbon dioxide will produce a little bit of acid, but not a lot. But if the carbon dioxide level goes up and up and up, it actually produces quite a lot of acid. If you're trying to kind of remember that carbon dioxide produces acid, if you think about carbonated beverages, like seltzer. Seltzer is just water with carbon dioxide pumped into it. But it changes the flavor because when you pump that much carbon dioxide into it, it produces acid, which gives it just a slightly more sour flavor, which is usually why you need to add something to it. But even plain seltzer has a distinct flavor. It also contributes to the acidity of things like soda. So, all right. <clears throat> so, acid, your body is very good at sensing, especially since these cute little hydrogen ions with their little pluses. Yeah, those are far easier to sense than oxygen. So when your body recognizes a change in acidity, when the acidity decreases, then it's able to figure that out. So it does have a sensor, but interestingly enough, it's not an oxygen sensor, it's a pH sensor. Your body senses the electrolyte change, essentially, which your body's far better at. All right, it's gotta send it somewhere. In this case, it is gonna send it to the brain. Your brain definitely controls your oxygen levels, and specifically, because you don't have to think about them, the medulla oblongata, that back behind part of the brain where the cardiac center is, also the respiratory center. Then what? What's it gonna do? Well, at that point, it's gotta tell you whether or not you need more oxygen. What did we say about more oxygen? How do you get it? Well, you get it by breathing more, which is gonna mean movement in your muscles. So you will move, actually I'll just write the muscles, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles are your effectors. Interestingly enough, in this case, I won't add a second arrow to it because it's the same muscles. It's just whether or not they are increasing, they're doing more movement or less movement. So if you need less oxygen, you would have less movement of those muscles. They'd relax more. If you have more oxygen, you'd have more movement of those muscles. It would increase the number of times they contracted and therefore increase the number of times that your body took in the air and therefore increasing the amount of oxygen that you would get. So now let's back relate this to something like exercise. So we've done exercise before. We know exercise requires energy. What do we say? Well, oxygen is a key component of creating energy. So we need more oxygen. Your blood is already trying to pump oxygen to your body, but it's going to try to get more. So what's it going to do? Well, it's going to say, hey, there's not enough oxygen. When you exercise and your muscles are going faster than you and they don't produce enough oxygen or they don't have enough oxygen to use, they will use anaerobic methods, which produce things like lactic acid. So even though this is all happening at lower levels, you actually do notice sometimes the acidity change of a lack of oxygen because your muscles burn. Match the acidity. Hopefully your medulla actually picked up the acidity long before you did. But then what it does is it'll go to your diaphragm and your intercostals. It'll tell them they should contract more and you'll start breathing heavier, which is fantastic because then you'll get more oxygen and it will help to bring it to those places, provide energy and fix the acidity. That's how it works. One final note about the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. They're kind of sneaky because they are skeletal muscles. That means you have conscious control over them. And we know that because a moment ago, I actually consciously controlled them to show you how breathing works. Your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles can be controlled. Now, if you're not specifically thinking about them, 
they don't need to be controlled. Not an issue. Your module will take care of it for you and make sure that you are still breathing. But if you want to hold your breath for a period of time, you can do so. Although you become unconscious, your medulla just takes over again and then starts you breathing again. So as long as you haven't actually deprived your body of enough oxygen to shut down your brain, your body will take over and it's not a problem. So if your child wants to like, you know, stand there and hold their breath, mostly they're just going to start breathing again and they'll be fine. So, um, Oh, one other note about how the oxygen and the carbon dioxide work because they're kind of interesting. So in the cellular respiration equation, as we've noted, we have oxygen, which is O2, and we add it to sugar, which is actually carbon, C6, H12, O6. And what we're gonna do with that is we're going to produce, when those two things combine, they produce energy and they have waste products of carbon dioxide, which we already know is CO2, and water. You might have known that, but your body produces water when you make energy. It's actually real cool. H2O. So I'm going to point something interesting out about the way this equation works. The oxygen, interestingly enough, when it goes through this energetic process, actually gets broken in half, and this is a huge part of what produces the energy, breaking that oxygen molecule in half, and it becomes the water. Oxygen in your body actually produces water. So wait, where's the CO2 come from? We don't just attach carbon to oxygen and call it CO2. No, no, no. The CO2 is actually the breakdown of the sugar. When you use sugar in your body, it breaks down, the hydrogens get pulled off, and the C's and the O's recombine, boom, to make carbon dioxide, which is what you breathe out. So the sugar becomes the carbon dioxide that you breathe out, and the oxygen becomes the water that you either use or excrete. And so it's an interesting process since the O2 and the CO2 almost don't meet at all, except in the lungs where they're exchanged. So if you want to know more about that process, I'll have to make another whole video because it is a whole complicated thing, but it's really cool. Your body's way of making energy is one of my favorite things. All right. So that is all the stuff you need to know about how your respiration works, how it relates to your actual body functions, and how it helps you with energy production.